Praise God. We are this morning going uh, to preach a message out of John chapter 11, if you would. John chapter 11. <clears throat> Amen. If you would uh, stand. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. You'll see where I'm going in just a few minutes. But, but uh, please, I, I, need, I need everybody to be paying attention this morning and to help me out. Amen? John chapter 11, we'll skip down in the story to verse 38. It actually is almost the entire chapter. John chapter 11, verse 38. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. <clears throat> Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days, speaking of her brother Lazarus. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it that they might believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. For a little while this morning, I want to preach on this subject, destroying the power of sin's graveyard. Destroying the power of sin's graveyard. Praise the Lord. Brother LG, pray for us. Amen and amen. Lord bless you. You can wave at each other and you may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God is good. Amen. amen. And he's good all the time. <clears throat> researchers are in overdrive. For the past several years, researchers have been trying, attempting, working to determine the reasons for a decline in uh, embracing Christianity. Many reasons are listed by uh, those surveyed, but there are a few that stood out to me as I was preparing for this message. The decline of Christianity. Many folks are saying there is a lack of relevant teaching about the Bible and how to apply the Bible to today's situations as opposed to the teaching that is going on in colleges that is many times agnostic and atheist at the best, questioning every bit of scripture and anything that, that uh, the Bible teaches based on scientific evidence. And, and, and so they're, they're, they're believing these lies from the colleges and universities. I'm not against college and universities, uh, but I believe that we should prepare our students, future students, our children, our grandchildren to go into that mess and get what they need out of education instead of being reoriented about what they believe in God. Yeah. Praise God. The second uh, reason that uh, has been listed is there is a desire to be spiritual but not religious. You know what this tells me? People are developing their own religion. I don't like what religion and what uh, is telling me uh, the Bible says, so I'm going to create something that I want to live within. I'm going to create my own morality. I'm going to create my own normal. Well, you've created your own religion. Don't call it anything then. Uh, but so they want to be spiritual, but they want to define what spiritual means, and they don't care what God says spiritual means. The third reason given is they're just too busy. And life has done that. The greed and desire for more and more and more and more and more has driven families to many times be a, a two, three, four income. Husband, wives working two, three, four jobs 
chasing the almighty dollar. As I've said many times, Jesus doesn't say it's wrong to be rich. Jesus says it's wrong to fall in love with the riches he blesses you with. Right. Praise God. And the fourth uh, reason that I find that sticks out in my mind, and again, there are hundreds of reasons given, is hypocrisy in Christianity. Praise God. People saying they believe in the Bible. People saying they believe in what Jesus says. But their lives don't mirror what Jesus said one iota. They pick and choose how they want to serve God. They pick and choose which of the Ten Commandments they want to obey. And so it's hypocrisy. <clears throat> Praise God. I, I was going back again through my messages over the past several weeks, really since just about before Corona hit. And there's been a strong focus over the past several weeks on preparing ourselves for God's work and preparing ourselves for His return. And, and, and I, I just listened to the titles and the messages, launch out into the deep. And, and what are you wearing today? And what are you doing while waiting for Jesus? And the power of an experience last week. And, and, and then the, the, the three-part series on the Ten Commitments. Praise God. It's been a focus on getting ourselves ready, straightening up the things that might be a little bit wrong or need adjusting, right? I mean, come on, after all, the moon shot that landed uh, uh, the, the Apollo project on the moon took thousands of course corrections between earth and the moon. And, well, why shouldn't our journey from here to heaven's gates uh, take many corrections uh, as we go along the way? I'm not afraid of correction. I'm afraid of being off course. Praise God. I've got to make heaven my home or I've wasted 30 years of my life. Praise God. Amen. This week I felt a change in the direction for future messages. Uh, but today, I, I, I think I, this is a capstone on, on maybe what we could call a series of, of messages that have gone forth. And I'd like to address what I think is at least one reason for hypocrisy among Christianity. One reason. Just one. There's many. But here's one that stuck out in my, my mind. That the... the the story that we looked at today, of course, is the death of Jesus' friend Lazarus. We know that Jesus delayed in, in coming to Lazarus' aid for a specific purpose. He's been in the grave at least four days when Jesus shows up and, and, and uh, encounters Martha and Mary, the two sisters of Lazarus, and then makes his way to a graveyard where Lazarus is lying. And in these verses, verses 38 through 44, I see at least three commands from Jesus. Three commands. And I want to talk about those commands this morning. In verse 38, he, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. That's the first command that I want to focus on. Take ye away the stone. Lazarus is in the grave. Lazarus is dead. And while death keeps Lazarus from coming to Jesus, that stone represents a barrier that keeps Jesus from raising Lazarus. Amen. In, li in this life, we are spiritually dead. Lazarus was dead physically, but we are spiritually dead. Romans 3 and 23 indicates for a few have sinned. A couple have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6 and 23 says very plainly, the wages of that sin is death. Yes, a physical death, but more importantly, a spiritual death. It separates us from God. We can't go to where God is. If you look at another Lazarus in the Bible and the rich man, the parable, Lazarus is in, uh, uh, the, in hell, in torment, uh, and there is a great gulf that separates him. I'm sorry, I said Lazarus. The rich man is in hell in that uh, place of torment, and there is a great gulf that separates him from Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. The wages of sin is death. And we have many 
barriers like that stone that keep us from coming to God and keeps God from reaching us. I noted some of those barriers at the beginning of this sermon, but there are numerous reasons for not wanting to give up our sinful lifestyle. That's what it takes. Get rid of that. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, but they, they, holding on to sin is short-term thinking. When all we do, uh, you know, like Esau, Esau only was considering the here and now. I want the stew because I'm about to starve to death. You don't starve to death in 12 hours. Amen. He, he, he just wanted that pot of beans. He just wanted something in his belly because he felt a little pain, for a little hurry earth, and he wanted something to eat. And that's how people are who live by the flesh. They want to please the flesh in the here and now. They're not interested in what's coming later. The good feelings, the high, the relief from life's miseries is only temporary because when you eat that pot of beans, it's going to be a few more hours and you're hungry again. Praise God. That relief might be temporary, but let me tell you something. Eternal judgment is eternal. <clears throat> Jesus said, take away the stone. Praise God. The second command is found in the 43rd verse. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I like it. Jesus didn't rebuke death. Death, I rebuke you. He didn't talk to Satan. Now look, Satan, you're going to have to let him go. You know, he, he didn't command death to leave Lazarus' body. No. He simply said, Lazarus, come forth. And Jesus told Thomas, I am the way, the truth. Get back here. And get, go back forward then. All right, come on. We're going to do it again. Look forward. Get back, get back. Get, where did you go? My goodness. I love technology. Lord, Lord, help me this morning. Did we go all the way back to the front? How did I get there? Yep, all the way back to the front. My goodness, I'm better than I thought. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus told Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus said, I'm life. He simply commanded life back into Lazarus. He didn't rebuke anything. He didn't have to fuss at anybody. He just looked and said, you come forth right now because I'm commanding life to be restored to this body. Look, in this life, Jesus broke sin's stranglehold on us in the same way. In John chapter 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, it is Finished, And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What was finished? Sin's stranglehold on mankind. Praise God. Sin's control over us is gone because through his death and his burial and his resurrection, he gave us power over sin. Praise the Lord. I, I just constantly think back to Genesis chapter 4 and the story with Cain and Abel. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? Why are you so upset? And why is your countenance, why is your attitude fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest uh, uh, not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I, I want to read that verse 7 in the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, uh, it says this, if you do what's right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is waiting for you. Crouching at the door. Sin's desire is for you. But you must rule over. The problem was in the Old Testament, they didn't have the power to rule over sin. Praise God. But in the New Testament, with the Holy Ghost, we've got power, and we're the ones who are supposed to be ruling over the sin. Amen. They couldn't do it because they weren't empowered to. But we are. I'm talking about hypocrisy within Christianity. Amen. Jesus gave us that power and said, you don't need to be a hypocrite. Praise God. You just need to be in walking in that power every day. Praise God. 
That is what the new birth provides humanity. Power over sin. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. We are free this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then there's verse 44. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand, foot, grave clothes, face was bound about the napkin. Jesus saying unto him, Loose him and let him go. Lazarus was alive, but he wasn't going very far wrapped up. He wasn't going very far wrapped up. Amen. Praise God. This is my wrappings this morning. Don't y'all get upset. This is just, I know it's toilet paper and it was at a high price commodity back then. Now, now the, the historians say there's different ways that they wrapped him up. Some believe that they wrapped him up just like Anna's doing right now. Some believe that they wrapped up their arms and their legs first. And, and, and some believe that, you know, then they put another sheet over them. One more time around, baby. And, and, you know, all that stuff. You know, I don't know uh, how it was done, uh, but they wrapped him up. Just tuck it right here, and you can go. Thank you, baby. And, you know, but he was wrapped up. Now, you know, it, he, he called Lazarus for Get up! But he's bound. He's got grave clothes on. Best he can do, no matter how he was wrapped up, is get over to, to where he can, you know what? But that, and then Jesus says, loose him and let him go. And somebody was there, to, thank goodness it was talking. Somebody was there to loose the grave clothes off of him and to let him go. Amen. Uh, 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 some think that Lazarus wasn't covered with spices yet. And that's why Martha uh, was saying, oh, he stinketh. They didn't do it. The grave clothes represent hindrances to our Christian walk and our spiritual growth. You got to hear me this morning? Keeping the grave clothes on hinders us from being what the Lord wants us to be. Well, what are you talking about? Grave clothes. Grave clothes represent the hindrances. What kind of hindrances? Well, sometimes we hang on to religious or social traditions. That's not the way my mama believed it. That's not the way it happened here. My family does this. Our culture does that. I'm not interested in mama, family, or culture. I want to know what the Bible says. Yeah. Mama's not going to get me to heaven. Culture's not going to get me to heaven. Tradition ain't going to get me to heaven. But the Bible and what Jesus said and being born again is going to get me to heaven. I've got to get rid of some great clothes. Old habits, sinful lifestyle. And I, I'm sorry to say it, but there's just some friends that will lead. Hey, they're the ones that led us in the wrong direction to begin with. Why are we hanging on to them? Well, they're just good people. No, they're not good people. But they're friendly. They might be friendly, but they're not good for you spiritually. That's what I'm talking about. They may give away everything they have to the poor. They may feed the homeless on, uh, at the soup kitchen every weekend. They may give away uh, half of their money uh, to, to worthy causes. But where are they spiritually? Amen. Praise God. Self-reliance. Man, oh man. Uh, I'm so sick of seeing self-help books. They may help you learn math. They may help you navigate uh, leadership problems. Uh, they may even give you an opportunity to work on your self-esteem. But self-help ain't got nobody to heaven. Right. Come on. Even though you, you may be too weak in your walk uh, or too prideful to ask for help. Praise God. There are plenty who want to get old wounds. Well, so-and-so said this about me. I got an easy one for that. Shut off your social media. If you're that easily offended, if you're that thin-skinned, if you can't scroll past a few ignorant people who want to say bad things on Facebook because they won't say it to your face, it's time to do something else. Right. Praise God. I'm on Facebook to reach people and find out about my family. I'm not interested in what you think I think. Praise the Lord. Old wounds and a failure to forgive. A failure to forgive. Folks, this is the thing that is going to send us to hell. Because he said, if you don't forgive, I'm not going to forgive you. 
Got a check right there. Praise God. And forgiving people ain't saying, I forgive you, and the next time you get a chance to talk about them, you run them into the ground because of what they did to you. You didn't forgive them then. Well, forgive and forget. I don't believe that either. I'll never forget what some people did to me. But it don't hurt anymore, and I don't hold it against them anymore. But I did learn some things. And that's we learn from our mistakes. And we learn from the mistakes of others. But we got to learn how to forgive. Amen? And, and, and look, there's a lack of true commitment of ourselves to the Lord. I mean, come on. Come on. Just look at who put look at the people that call themselves Christians today and what they're being arrested for. And what they're being uh, excoriated for in the news. Or what they're being uh, 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 brought to the front of the congregation for in some churches. That's not Christianity. That's not being in love with God. Amen. That's a Christian in name only. You can call yourself what I want. But look, calling my wife queen of the world don't make it so as much as I'd like it to be. <laughs> the problem is we're holding on to some grave clothes. <laughs> we got to let go of some things. Amen. Why? Because people are looking at us. We, we, got to, we got to let go and change clothes. You can't get out the graveyard if you... If, you can't get out the graveyard if you don't change out your grave clothes. Yeah. Hindrances, impediments, obstacles, interferences, they keep us from becoming what God wants us to become. Right. In the natural world... If, you know, if our children or grandchildren don't keep up with the standard scale of growth, yeah, ladies, y'all know what I'm talking about because every time you brought your kid to the doctor's office, where are they on the scale? How many percentile? Uh-huh. If they weren't keeping up mentally or physically, you were worried. You started asking some questions. You wanted some answers of what's going on. Why was your child's growth impeded? Why was your child's mental capacity not where it should have been? But it doesn't seem to bother us too much in the spiritual realm. Can't say amen, say oh me. Praise God, amen. I mean, I've run across people who are called Christians that don't even know there is a standard. The Bible, praise God. Problem is, they're not getting enough teaching about the Bible to help them become spiritually mature. I'm sorry, but, but 57 songs, prayer time, and two minutes of preaching is not teaching people the Word of God. It's a feel-good experience. And it's not causing us to spiritually mature. Praise God. It's one reason for hypocrisy among Christians today. We don't completely remove the grave clothes from our lives. In three commands, in the, in the three commands of Jesus, we looked at that one is something that only Jesus could do. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus couldn't put life back in his body. Jesus said, Martha couldn't do CPR four days. He wasn't coming back, right? Only Jesus could bring that man back to life. Amen. Jesus, but two of those commands were something that Jesus required others to do. Take the stone away, remove the grave clothes. You see, Jesus will not do what we are capable of doing. Jesus will not do what it is our part to do and get accomplished. He's going to leave it up to us. Having us do something allows us to have a part in what God is doing in our lives. He doesn't want us to just sit back and be disengaged in the miracle of the moment. He wants us to have a Look, this is not a new concept in the Bible. 
Jesus has always asked people to do something. In John chapter 2, he said, fill the water pots. He could have easily said, where's the water pots? Never mind, I'll just create some and have some wine automatically put in it. But he asked humans to get the water pots and fill them with water. In Matthew chapter 12, he tells the man in the synagogue, stretch forth your hand. And immediately his hand is uh, made as good as new. Uh, in John 9 and 7, he tells the blind man, go wash at the pool of Siloam. In Luke 17, he says, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, you see, He asks us to do something and it's in our obedience to what He asked us to do we find a miracle of the moment. Praise God. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 11, He said to the man with the palsy who had come down through the roof, Arise, take up thy bed and go into thine house. Go thy way into thine house. The Lord has always put something on us to do. Hit David, go kill a lion. David, go kill a bear. David, go kill a giant. Right. Praise God. David, exercise some self-control out there on that housetop. You see, sometimes it's a lot harder to hold back than step out. Uh-oh. It's a whole lot harder to hold back than to step out and go forward. David had had a lot of success with stepping out. Didn't do too good with holding back. Praise the Lord. Loose him and let him go. We can't expect the generations of young people following us to listen to the words we say and ignore how we live. Christians today are going to church they're reading their Bible. They're praying. And then they're living however they want to live. Come on. I, mean, I, I didn't look up the statistic, but I imagine weddings are going downhill. You know, don't have to be married anymore. Praise God. Weddings are going downhill. Don't have, don't have to take it too far till, till we, we see the number of alcoholics among Christians. Look, I, I looked at every statistic. You pick one out. I looked at every one of them, and the church ain't far behind the world. What happened to come out from among them? Be ye separate, saith the Lord. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. What happened? And what do we want our children or our grandchildren to emulate? Or do we care? Because what's happened in Christianity is we're saying one thing and we're living a different way. And what do you think young impressionable minds are going to do? What you do. What you do. Praise God. Do as I say and, and not as I do only go so far. Praise God. Living in ways completely contradictory to the Word of God is a recipe for disaster. Losing the next generation. Look, moving that stone, moving that stone took faith. I mean, even Martha stumbles. Come on. Oh, I know, Lord, that you're going to raise my brother at the end. I, I, I am the resurrection. Oh, okay. Oh, man. But something happened to her on the way to the graveyard. And when she saw that stone and Jesus said, take the stone away, she says, oh, 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 no, Lord, he's stinking. She forgot all about that faith she exhibited. Moving stones, barriers in your life to come to the Lord takes faith. Takes faith. Praise God. And thank God for faith. But removing and keeping the grave clothes off takes commitment and spiritual discipline. And a lot of people give it up and go back and start sneaking some grave clothes back in because they're not realizing spiritual growth fast enough this world has all of us fooled instant grits instant this instant that you know well, it's kind of slowed down since corona showed up i mean come on you could so tony put an order in that uh, to to a very popular uh, uh website this week and, and in, in less than a few days we got it wow I, I ordered something yesterday and it'll be here today 
Oh, instant, instant. So we expect God to fit into our instant idea of how we should receive prayers answered and how we should grow spiritually. But chronologically and mentally, it took time. It took 67 years for me to look this good. Removing the grave and keeping them off. That's the thing. We can remove them, but are we going back and sneaking a piece back in? Or it's just a small piece. Or isn't it a little one? It's a little one. Isn't that what Lot said? It's just a little seed. Keeping them off. But the Lord is here to help us. It's not just removing. It's not just keeping off. It's what we put on. Remember the parable? Jesus said you swept your house, you cleaned it, the Spirit left. Be careful because how many more will come back? Seven more come back. Why? Because you didn't prepare the house so that no more would come in. But Jesus didn't leave us like that. Jesus said, get rid of the grave clothes. Keep them off of you. But more importantly, I want you to put some things on. It's not just uh, uh, to, re to remove and keep off, but replace those grave clothes with something better. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Scripture indicates, and that you put on the new man, the new person, you got rid of the old guy, you killed it, you buried it, and you rose up in the newness of life. Put that new person on. What's a new man? That new man is a new appetite. That, that new man is new desires. That, 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 that new person is, 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 is wanting to please God now and not please flesh. Am I making any sense this morning? Praise God. Put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Come on, folks. We are wrapping it up. Jesus is getting ready to pour out a great revival and we have to be the ones that are the examples for this next generation. I can still see men and women of God that I looked up to when I got in the church on First Pentecostal Church on Victoria Drive. The victorious church on Victoria Drive. And I looked at them and I admired them for their walk with God. And I wanted to be like them. Praise God. Yes, I kept my eyes on Jesus because that's the thing that kept me from being discouraged when the people in the church who didn't emulate Jesus fell by the wayside. Because if we're watching people instead of Jesus, when they fall away and we thought they were great, it'll affect us. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus and we pick those in the congregation that, exhi that uh, uh, exhibit something in their lives that keeps them strong and you know their walk is real. Praise God. Put on that new man. Righteousness and true holiness. Then in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, he indicates, for as many of you have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ. It means you have been clothed with Christ. He didn't just strip off those grave clothes. He put Himself on you. He, and it's the Holy Ghost. On you and in you. Amen? He gave that to you so that you and I could walk around and be clothed with something that would keep sin at bay. Oh, God. Help us to recognize what you're doing, Lord, in our lives. Help us to recognize that you want us not to be hypocrites, that you don't even want us to be lukewarm. You want us to be on fire for you, on fire in living for you every moment of the day. Praise God. And finally, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God. Why would he say that? Because we're in spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. Man alive. When, when I, we were in the military, when they called you out, for, I'll never forget the day Cyprus invited, in, 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 invaded Greece and we got the call to get ready to be shipped out down to Greece or wherever, uh, Cyprus, 
wherever they needed us. And we had to load all that equipment up. And we had to put on all our gear. And we just sat in those trucks while they were loading the artillery and loading all the other units up onto C-130 airplanes to take them off. And the, heli the, the propellers were running. We were the last section to be called for the 30-minute run to Ryan Main Air Base to get into the, the airplanes and be flown to the Cyprus for some impending battle. I remember that. Before we could leave, uh, the call came in. Cancel the alert. Cancel the alert. But there were things that we had to do to get ready. The Lord says there are things to do to get ready for this battle in the end times. And that is put on the whole armor of God. I mean, we ought to get up in the morning stand in front of the mirror and say, oh, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shield your feet shod with the gospel, preparation of the gospel. Just, just walk through it two or three times and think about what you're saying because we are preparing for it to go out of our doors uh, that sanctuary that the angels of the Lord have encamped around us all during the night to, and we're prepared to get into that vehicle and drive away from our sanctuary out into a world that is bent on destroying us. And I'll go through the motions just to help remind me of what I'm facing every day. The world is not our friend. The world is not the friend of Jesus. We're the friends of Jesus. He called Abraham and said, You are a friend of God. Praise God. We are the friends of God now. More than that, we're a royal priesthood. And more than that, we're His bride. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And His bride does battle against the spiritual forces that are trying to destroy. Praise God. Show the world a person changed for the better. Show the world a person changed for the better. Take those brave clothes off and remove those things. Kick them out of the way. Get them, get them out of your way and put on the new man. Put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the armor of God. Show the world a person changed for the better. Show your children and your grandchildren the power of God working in you to make you a better person, a better parent, a better Christian. Praise God. And put on Christ and destroy the power of sin's graveyard. Destroy. We're not meant, we're not meant to live in the graveyard. We're not meant to live in those grave clothes. They hamper us. They hinder us. They keep us from being what we should be reaching our full potential in the kingdom of God. No, I don't want those things. I want what God has for me to put on. That new man. Praise God. Christ. Amen. And the whole armor of God. Why? So that we can destroy the power of of sin's graveyard. We don't live in the graveyard. Our name is not the man of Gadara. We are not filled with legion. We are filled with the Holy Ghost and we don't belong in the graveyard. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord this morning. Hallelujah.